Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor and Brad Garlinghouse has retweeted the NFT tweet from uh, Nick Bogles. New year, new XRP ledger capabilities. And uh, so this is uh, what's coming, looks like. Uh, NFTs on the XRP ledger, something to be excited about. Crypto Dim sent me, um, I can't, I don't know if he sent me that. I think he did, he sent me the video of this. I want to play you this clip. This is that guy. He was going, it was going around um, the other day, the Reaper Financial or something like that. I wanted to play it. It's interesting. You may not agree with the guy, but I want to play it for it's the interesting. Company's position is not necessarily a defense of Ripple Labs, nor is it specifically a hit piece against the SEC, though that may be well deserved under, under certain opinions. Um, what we are specifically talking about is how this plays out to the XRP holders and those who are using the XRP ledger. So we don't want the government coming in and telling us that our property is somehow not our property. Um, if they were to see fit that we can no longer possess XRP, then they do owe just compensation for said XRP. And that just compensation is a calculation of the total debts, assets, and liabilities of the U.S. dollar because the United States dollar is, per the Bretton Woods Agreement, the uh, global reserve currency. And it's currently completely unbacked by anything. XRP is backed by uh, hard mathematics. And given that it has a, a solid foundation in the digital universe. That means that the US dollar having no foundation whatsoever at this point uh, must be divided amongst those XRP. Okay, now you you may think that uh, the type of calculations he's doing are, are not reasonable or whatever, but that's not really what I wanted to comment on. What I, John Deaton over and over and over has told us that they are saying that the SEC is saying that all XRP is a security. The XRP itself is a security. The XRP that you and I are buying and selling is a security. And I think what the SEC is getting at there is they're trying to say that only accredited investors can trade in these digital assets. I believe that's... So there is a scenario, I think, where this lawsuit ends and all XRP current and future that's traded is only available for accredited investors to trade. So if that lawsuit comes down and you are not an accredited investor, what would that mean? Well, in that scenario, couldn't it mean that they say, well, we're not allowed to hold it maybe give you a window of time where you have to turn it in. And if you do so, would you turn it in at their price or so, you know, maybe, maybe that's all crazy talk, but there, that is, I think what they're trying to say in the lawsuit that, for accredited investors, it would be fine. In other words, if you're wealthy or an institution or a bank, then you could buy and sell and trade XRP. That is a scenario, folks. I mean, all right. Now, this is also an interesting clip from that guy's, uh, and I don't know his name, but anyway. The situation is that uh, none of this was by accident and the timing is never a coincidence. I don't believe in coincidences. Um, I think that as the Bitcoin bull market ends in likely April, that is when the uh, SEC case against Ripple Labs will likely also end and that will give Ripple the ability and timing to surpass uh, Bitcoin as the number one cryptocurrency and uh, run away from there. I think that's the most likely scenario. Well, I do think that, that XRP is going to take its rightful place. I don't know how that happens, but anyway, XRP Bart, um, Powell, Fed digital dollar can coexist with private stable coins. So we'll see how all this pans out. Interesting. Now, you want to talk about interesting folks? Just when you think that we couldn't find any more clips of these Ethereum guys 
running their mouths were wrong. Watch this. This is from, I think, August of 2021. I found this the these clips on the Ethereum Alliance website, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, uh, not website, but YouTube channel. This was their anniversary of, um, you know, um, the anniversary of, I don't know if it, what, what it was the anniversary of, but it was the anniversary of something. All right, I want you to listen to these. Now, you need to know the guy right here, he either is or was a partner at Andres and Horowitz and a on the I think on the board maybe at Coinbase. I think he was the CTO at Coinbase at one time. Listen to these guys run their mouths. I hope they keep running their mouths too because I feel like there's going to be one fine day when they're not going to want to run them anymore. You know, Vitalik, do you think that you could have done Ethereum as an American? Like, because as a Canadian, you did the Swiss Foundation and so on. But could you have done it as an American? Mm, again, it would, it, would, it would definitely have been harder. Like, it's actually, yeah, like, there's more headaches in setting up or participating in Swiss things if you're a U.S. citizen. Like, there are basically, yeah, a lot of these uh, banks are actually, like, basically, yeah, forced to uh, discriminate against the U.S. citizens in, very, or in uh, various ways because of uh, just, like, internet and extraterritorial legal issues. Um, but um, this also reminds me of a, yeah, the, a, the, the, do you remember the yeah, the story that um, I yeah, was actually, yeah, when I started my whole uh, Bitcoin uh, trip, um, my original plan had been to do my yeah, university co-op term with uh, Ripple, right? And, uh, oh, like really? I, call, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. I, I called up Jen McCaleb and he basically said yes in five minutes. Um, and then we started going through the uh, US visa bureaucracy. And um, it turns out that the usual channel for getting my that my uh, J1 visa did not work because um, it required the company to have existed for one year and it only existed for nine months. And mm. so we tried fumbling around through the system for a couple of uh, months and eventually we gave up. And so, you know, the moral of the story basically is um, that, um, you know, if uh, if you if the visa stuff had been simpler, then, you know, I would have been working for Ripple now instead of uh, doing you know, XRP standard. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, it, 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 exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, now I want, I want to put this in context. Here's a guy from Andrews and Horowitz. I think he was at Andrews and Horowitz that, that's now called A16Z when they invested in Ripple. He's literally making fun of Ripple and XRP the standard. That's pretty unbelievable. But it also is very telling. Yeah, I'm not done yet. So, yeah, no, Brian Kaplan is wrong. Immigration uh, restrictions can, can't do some good after all. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> nice. I guess his Ripple would have been working for you at this point. Uh, <laughs> rather than up on his own tangent. Yeah, okay. yeah. Joseph Lubin, he just can't keep himself from running his mouth. Don't you worry. We've got, uh, we're going to. We're going to make sure to play all of your words while you keep running your mouth. I want I want you to keep on talking. It's it 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 adds plenty of entertainment here. Now, same this is from the same thing the same thing and look look if you go back right here you'll see. It's the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance anniversary special, okay? Wait till you hear this folks because now we know now we know that Andres and Horowitz was with Ethereum from early on, all the way back to 2013. Listen up. Hey, James, thank you. Hey, Bologi. Hey, Vitalik. Well, that's a very hey, kind Joe. introduction, but I think that mm. Vitalik and Joe have done a little bit more for Ethereum than I have. I'm just, uh, but I have, you know, I've helped on the margins, but it's obviously all of you guys. Um, so... Um, thanks for that intro. Uh, I guess I'm going to be, I guess, the quasi moderator here. But um, so got a few questions uh, by Joe Vitalik. Can you guys both hear me? Audio guys? Yes. Yeah, very clear. Good, good. good. Um, so, you know, just starting out with like the history of Ethereum, um, you know, I remember Vitalik uh, when. Uh, you know, most people don't know this, but you and uh, a group that became Blockstream, another group that became Colored Coins, all came into um, A16Z in 2013 when me and Dixon were general partners. Okay, that's him and Chris Dixon. Remember that name? They were general partners at An Andrews and Horowitz. They're meeting with the Ethereum founders in 2013. There, right. And 
uh, you know, I remember asking, you know, who's the founder? And everybody raised their hands at the same time. And I was like, <laughs> all right, that's, that's going to be, uh, there's going to be some fission events here. There's going to be some splitting and rejoining, and which, is, which is what happens, some recombination. And then at the uh, Bitcoin conference in, I think, 2014, um, you know, we, we all had that conversation. All right. Remember the Bitcoin Miami conference? Don't worry. I'm going to remind you in a minute. That's the conference where Vitalik Buterin got to the podium and he said he was talking about how they were going to conduct the fundraiser, right? But um, well, it turns out Andrews and Horowitz was there with him patio or lunch thing and the number of co-founders had now dropped to like seven or something like that so it was like a smaller number but still still n um and so i was like man th these guys are really smart this is extremely uh extremely decentralized and theoretical is this going to actually work um and i thought you guys were really smart but uh you know that, that's my recollection of that okay so my question now now we know we are in the videos we've shown before We've heard from Joseph Lubin two or three times on two or three different occasions that JP Morgan was there with Ethereum before the launch of the Ethereum token, before the pre-sale, JP Morgan was there. Now we know that Andrews and, Hor Andrews and Horowitz, A16Z, was also there before the Ethereum pre-sale. That's the significance of this video. So what I decided to do is put this little timeline together for you, okay? 2013, the Ethereum founders, in, they're in the offices of a, A16Z, which is Andrews and Horowitz. 2014, A16Z attends the Bitcoin conference. That's where the Ethereum founders announce their ICO. To, later in 2014, the Ethereum ICO occurs. Whales are disguised because Joseph Lubin says it. Don't worry, we've got the, we've got the video. 2018, fast forward. Jay Clayton meets with a with with Andrews and Horowitz. The venture capital working group is put together is put in motion. Chris Dixon is the guy he picks to to put the industry players together. That's the same Chris Dixon that in the video you just heard was was with him meeting with the Ethereum founders in their office in 2013. Okay, so later in 2018, after this venture capital working group eventually puts the safe harbor memo together that's put together and written by Lowell Ness, the Andrews and Horowitz attorney, then in, later in 2018, that safe harbor memo becomes the Hinman Ethereum free pass speech. And then in 2021, Hinman joins Andrews and Horowitz. But you don't have to take my word for it because we have all, we have the timeline we have the video and here it is. Well, like, uh, let me go back. You know, I remember Vitalik uh, when, uh, you know, most people don't know this, but you and uh, a group that became. Okay, now remember, he's with Andrews and Horowitz. He's a general partner with Chris Dixon when they came in in 2013, the Ethereum founders. Blockstream, another group that became Colored Coins, all came into um, A16Z in 2013 when me and Dixon were general partners there, right? And, uh, you know, I remember asking, you know, who's the founder? And everybody raised their hands at the same time. And I was like, <laughs> all right, that's, that's going to be, uh, there's going to be some fission events here. There's going to be some splitting and rejoining, and which, is, which is what happens in recombination. And then at the uh, Bitcoin conference in, I think, 2014, um, you know, we, we all had that conversation out on uh, it was a patio or a lunch thing. And the number of co-founders had now dropped to like seven or something like that. So it's like a smaller number, but still, still in. Okay. So that's the Bitcoin, the conference he's refer referencing, Bitcoin Miami 2014. Now watch what happens at that event. Okay, so I'll talk a bit about the about the funding model. So we will have a fundraiser for two months starting February starting February first. It will be available at funds.ethereum.org. So we will be, so the idea is that part of the initial issuance will be one one thousand ether for one bitcoin or up to two thousand ether for one bitcoin if you get in early to compensate for the increased risk. A person can can buy uh, from any number of different identities. We made a limit the size, the, the unit size of a sale, um, just to um, make it easier to disguise 
We then, after talking to Grunfest in a fireside okay, chat. so Lubin's helping them to disguise the sales. And then this is Lowell Ness, the attorney for injuries in Horowitz. And he's describing... When Joe, when Jay Clayton was at um, was given us he was on stage with Joseph Grunfest at um, Stanford and the next day he's describing how Jay Clayton went uh, uh, to Andrews and Horwitz the next day um, and told Chris Dixon to put together the the industry group they eventually called the venture capital working group and this guy is the Andrews and Horwitz attorney who puts together. The freaking safe harbor memo that becomes the Bill Hinman's Ethereum free pass speech. We then, after talking to Grunfest in a fireside chat at the Stanford um, uh, campus, uh, made his way over to see Andreessen the next morning. And this is the part that now not a lot of people know. Um, and he invited um, Chris Dixon to round up the sort of the, the industry um, players. Uh, Andreessen, I've been representing Andreessen and all of their crypto um, investments since the since the beginning, and so um, so I got the chance to be the one to, to write all that stuff. So, and then this is the article showing where Bill Hinman, um, after he gives the speech in 2018, and then a few years later he goes and joins Andreessen Horowitz. So I was making um, the uh, Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey letting them know. Here's the formation of the of Web3 on a silver platter, okay? These guys know, though, so don't you worry. Elon Musk, has anyone seen Web3? I can't find it. Jack Dorsey says it's somewhere between A and Z. M something something? So they know that Andrews and Horowitz was behind this. Now, I wanted to uh, bring something up to you. Um, this is a website. It's called Pitchmen. I'm, I'm uh, working with these guys kind of. PitchmenVC.com says looking for funding and promotion. We want to hear your idea. So these guys are, um, it's kind of like a way to try to uh, connect. Um, there's there's all kinds of, of companies, startups out there that are, that are listening to my voice that where it's people that either don't have any access to funding. They've got a, a company that's running maybe a website, uh, but they don't have any funding and, they, and nobody knows about them and their product. And so this is a way to try to help connect um, the, some of these startups in FinTech and blockchain to some of potentially some funding or potentially help in promoting. And so you can, all you gotta do is go to pitchmenvc.com and hit the contact button. Let me see, when you hit that, um, looking for funding or promotion. We want to hear your idea. It's kind of like um, the way I would describe this. It's kind of like Shark Tank on CNBC, but it's for social media or, or in social media because the truth is that the social media presence is is larger in this niche than than even CNBC is. So for the for the people in fintech, uh, for for startups in fintech and in blockchain. There is potentially more exposure here and more potential uh, sticking in this niche targeted um, focus than you would even get on going on to Shark Tank or, or on CNBC. So you just go on here and hit send message, fill out your name and email address and tell them, tell these guys about your, your company and give your website if you, if you got a website, any kind of information. Um, and if it's something that um, that's a fit, they'll reach out. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, and tell your friends and family to go check out pitchmenvc.com. Thank you for listening.